lines are in your picture plane, the more static your shot is going to be. Static. Your shot is going to be, right? And likewise, the closer you get to a diagonal, diagonal lines in your shot versus horizontal, the more dynamic, right? Your shot will be. So the more you can do this kind of stuff, where you're offsetting the angle of your picture and the subjects in your shot, you know, the more dynamic that can be. And let me sh give you an example of that. So what do I mean? It's like you, c you can have a very solemn, noble shot of, let's say, a king, right? And it's perfectly, he's between pillars, he's on his throne. And it's perfectly up, you know, upright, up and down. And so you get this kind of effect. But that can be kind of boring. So the second that I do this and just simply rotate the camera, even if a few degrees, you get you get this kind of relationship where the columns and the vertical and horizontal lines are a little bit offset. That creates more visual interest. So I try to do this in every single shot. I offset it a little bit, just a little bit, even if uh, it's a very kind of solemn static shot. I'll just tilt the camera ever so slightly, right? Just so that the 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 lines of composition in the picture frame are a little bit offset from your picture borders, from your edges. And of course, it becomes much more dynamic if you have you know you see this a lot in anime. We do this a lot on our show right now in Clone Wars. Is that you have you know it almost looks like the guy's gonna fall over, right? It's like whoop, and so y the lines of your screen here are going like this, right? So that creates a, a dynamic effect. And you can even plus that up, too, if you have the guy in perspective at an angle, right? So all you see is basically sky, right? But the sky grid would look like that. You have clouds, right? Airplane, whatever. So... So you see how that is? Are there too, hori too many horizontal and vertical lines in your shot? Important to, uh, to keep that in mind. Good silhouette. And that kind of goes without saying. You want to make things clear, right? Good silhouette. Interesting composition. Um, this comes in a, a lot of what I was talking about with originality. You want to make things interesting, unique. And do I cut from a low angle to a high angle, right? Profile shot, too flat, right? Ask yourselves these. And am I reusing this composition? Right, you want to keep things new and fresh. Don't reuse shots. Okay. All right. So let's use that example since it's, it's kind of fresh in our minds. Palpatine, Padme, uh, Jar Jar, Mace, Yoda. Uh, I think Plo Koon was over here. So I'm looking at an overhead view of, and this would be the back wall of Palpatine's office, right? So a lot of times what we do when we're talking about staging, so this is going to segue into the, we'll talk about staging. My spelling is horrible. Is uh, an overhead view, a map view, if you will, of the objects and characters in your, in your uh, stage, in your picture plane, in your scene. Um, you want to create a unique and interesting setup for these guys. Now, you c in this particular case, it was a given that they were going to be at their desk, and this hologram that's right here in the middle was going to be Hondo, and everybody else was going to be around it, kind of pointing in this direction. But now, like I said before, that could get really boring. So what I did, uh, for better or for worse, was to actually create some movement with not only the camera, but the characters. Right. So if you remember uh, Palpatine, I'll use another color. Palpatine gets up from his chair, and he moves back here. Right? Then Padme comes around this way and talks with him. And then she moves forward. Then after that, Palpatine moves forward, right? And of course after that, Padme moves around Palpatine into this position, right? And all the while we're cutting back to reactions of these characters here, Yoda, Mace, uh and we see Jar Jar a little bit, but Yoda and Mace are really the important ones here. And this movement is what what's called staging is how you arrange your characters in your stage to create 
visual interest. I'll show you what I mean with that. This concept of secondary action. We're talking about staging. Uh, secondary action also exists in animation. It's like, uh, uh, you know, like for example, uh, in animation is if the, uh, let's see, what's a good example? Can't come to mind, not come to mind right now, but it's like doing something that the character doing something uh, the character is talking about fishing but really what they're doing is tying their shoe right it's secondary action that's going on the same th same thing with this with uh, secondary action in your staging like for example these characters let's say they were talking about uh, deep diplomatic political missions and all the while what they're doing is playing cards right so they're in a card game and that's secondary action the, the, the fact of them playing cards doing something uh, that is extra to what they're actually talking about creates visual interest. Basically what you're doing, like I said, is a blueprint for the production process. What's important for me here is to establish the height of the camera and the staging for the characters. So I, I think it's clear enough that you see the four characters arranged, uh, you know, I even put Rex leaning on the table, that kind of stuff, but the extra details really aren't that important. Yeah, you can be loose with it. Um, I don't want to, uh, <laughs> you know, I feel ashamed to say, well, okay, this is acceptable because really what you should push yourselves to is to do something a little bit better than this. But uh, it's really the, the basic information is clear, right? There's two people. I mean, look how crusty this face is right there. You know, it's, it's basically meant to describe the action in the sequence and not necessarily worry about the drawing aspect of it. All right, does that kind of answer your question? Uh, when you know when I'm showing my portfolio, it's arranged in a number of ways. I have a lot of storyboards, uh, and this is one thing too to keep in mind too. When you're doing a storyboard portfolio, uh, show storyboards. A lot of times, um, you know, people, uh, young young guys uh, coming straight out of school, they don't necessarily tailor their portfolios to the job that they should uh, be going for. Like for example, if you're doing storyboards, put a lot of boards in your portfolio, even if they're rough like this. And then, of course, yeah, also put some of the more finished drawings that you have to show that you can draw, that you know anatomy and perspective and uh, character design and, and some other things that are related to uh, storyboarding. Also, sequ sequential art, if some of you guys have done comics and that kind of thing, that's more of a finished uh, kind of medium. So you want to do that, but you want to pepper your portfolio with that kind of stuff, but also the main beef of your portfolio should be storyboards. Right, sequential art that is applicable to the job at hand, whether it be cinematics, uh, commercial, uh, commercials in storyboards, kind of freelance live action style, or in this case, uh, you know, production TV boards. Right, you know, what what do you need to do to to become a storyboard artist? And and I'll caveat this by saying, uh, really good story people are hard to find. That's one of the things that that, I w that we discovered, you know, when I was at Pixar and now that I'm at Lucas, is that really uh, people who can tell stories well and have a deep knowledge of film language, composition, storytelling, uh, good cutting, good sense of staging, are, are is difficult to find because these skills are unique. And uh, so it's a plus for somebody who's interested in doing this kind of discipline because there is always a demand for people who can do this kind of job, whether it be in games, live action film, you know, what I do a lot in animation. And uh, one of the ways to get there, of course, is practice. You have to practice, practice, practice. And it's, you know, it's kind of sometimes it's a catch-22. People feel like, well, I can't get a job because I have no experience. And the only way to get experience is if I have a job. So it's kind of a catch-22 always. So one of the things that you need to do uh, is watch films. Get your knowledge of filmmaking and the film language up to speed. Learn about film history. Learn about uh, how people who have come before you have solved the, the visual problems that you will eventually have to tackle. Uh, you know, look at comics, look at other reference, that kind of thing. And tailor your portfolio to the type of production that you want to be in. So that that's easier said than done because, uh, you know, just as I was starting out not knowing really how to get into the business and what to do, uh, it came really from a passion, a deep desire to really keep up on your art, to keep with it, right? It's very difficult to get discouraged, especially in this kind of industry when there's probably not too many jobs out there, uh, you know, for younger cats starting out. And I, I give you these words of encouragement that don't get discouraged. Keep with your passion because that's something that will guide you uh, throughout your career. And if you can keep that fire under yourself throughout your artistic life, that you'll, it'll be so much more rewarding once you